Now we've gone through several passages of, of scripture and um, I'm probably going to have to read a lot of scripture today and I, I pray that you'll follow along with me. I don't believe that um, it will bore us. I believe that God will arouse in us, incite on the inside of us, this, this desire to move forward and to carry the gospel message in a way by which people who are hurting can really receive it. Today is lesson number nine. We're in the continuing series, Let Me Introduce You to Who I Really Am. Thank you, uh, youth ministry leaders, for helping me. Living a life that honors God is not difficult. Living a life that honors God is not difficult. Anybody you felt that it's, it's a hard task, it's difficult to live in a manner that glorifies God, you find it difficult? It really is not. The Bible says that his commandments are not grievous, they're not burdensome, and, and so it is, it is not difficult for us to live a life that honors God. And surely we recognize that we've all sinned, we've all missed the mark, We've all come short of the glory of God, but God has provided for us a plan for our redemption in the person of Jesus the Christ. The real question before us today is, do we really want to live lives that honor God? Do we want to live in a way where in every breathing second of our lives we model godliness, Christ-likeness, before a lost in a very dark world? That's really the question that we must answer because God has given us all that we need to live a life that honors him, a life that it would be humanly impossible to live this life without divine intervention, without divine enablement. Divine speaks to that which flows out of the very essence of God's being the very essence of his person. It would not be possible to live this life of holiness and integrity and character without divine enablement. And like so many of you all, I don't stand aloof because I can relate to the pain of the past. I have been there. I've learned to appreciate experiences because we don't grow without experiences with God. The experiences of life really speak to a tested story. We often want to share our testimonies. Then it must speak to a life that has been tested and a life that has been tried and a life that has been proven by experience. Testimony, just a tested story. I, like many of you all, have dealt with the fear of failure, the condemnation associated with just a portfolio of unwise choices. I've been there where I've experienced those feelings of inadequacy and insecurity and the guilt and the shame that goes along with disobeying God. Everybody has a past. We've all faced some disappointments. But what do you do when you have gone through these experiences or these disappointments? Have you learned anything from these experiences, these disappointments, the challenges and the, and the pain unique to just being in a fallen world and encased in a body of sin? God has given us grace. A grace that has been proven to be greater than our sins and greater than our ungodly choices and greater than the past. God has given us grace. And I want to repeat because grace is powerful. And it does speak to this aspect of divine enablement wherein God has taken care of sins past present, and future. He's provided us a freedom from the chokehold of sin. It's freedom. It's, it's a liberation that could only come as a result of one's relationship with Christ. But the freedom comes with boundaries. 
True freedom. Yes, it's a result of God's grace, but there are boundaries. And so we should have learned that liberation is a product of grace. This freedom that God gives to those who profess to be followers of Christ, indeed it is a product of his grace. Because he's given us divine enablement, we do not acquiesce to the influence of the world because God's grace, this divine enablement, rules on the inside of us. This ability to resist the pull, the power, and the persuasion of sin. Grace doesn't say that we won't be tempted. Grace does not say that life does not present its share of struggles, but Grace, that divine enablement, instead of resisting the truth, we resist the pull, the power, and the persuasion of sin. Sin, with its bait, understand this, it, it, it is very persuasive. It's very powerful. And there's a pull when it comes to sin, but grace enables us to say no. It's unfortunate that all too often, we focus too heavily on our weaknesses. It's a given. We have them, all of us. Our flaws, it's a given. We, we have them. There are no perfect people, right? With respect to uh, this element of being void of flawlessness. Now, we can be perfect in the Greek teleos in that we are a matured people. We are a people who are grounded. We are people who exercise self-government. We are people who are fully developed, lacking nothing essential to the whole. That level of maturity God expects of us. Are we all all right? But we don't have to bow to these weaknesses, and all of the struggles. Our creator sees us not based upon our weaknesses, our struggles. He sees who he created us to be. Amen. He sees who he created us to be, and, and, and he is fully aware, past, present, and future, of the choices that you and I make. The times when we go against him, right? The events of the past, God is fully aware. He has made choice of us. So we have grace to live life on this holy plateau. What is, what is this holy plateau? We stand higher. In other words, we yield to the commandments of God and not the dictates of the culture. We have grace. Charis in the Greek. Let's go through it again. Some of you already know this because you've been with us for an extended period of time. For those of you who don't know this, God has given us something that we did not merit. It's undeserved favor, and I don't know about you all, but I'm, I'm grateful that God has favored me. Amen. Unlike so many, and I thank God he's given me this heart, I don't seek any recognition from men. I don't seek, listen, the applause and the praises of men. I have no need for that because God has created me and endowed me with his Holy Spirit, and so I lack nothing essential to the whole when it comes to being complete in Christ. Amen. I have shared with uh, some of our, our classes uh, on Wednesdays and uh, just with some of the leaders that I go different places and um, I don't know these individuals and they'll say to me, I, I saw you on TikTok. And uh, I say, that's my son, that's not me. <laughs> you see, uh, Fred probably more than anybody is aware of my resistance to streaming and all these social media platforms. And so I have no personal uh, uh, Facebook page and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and all. I have none of that, you see. Now, understand, I don't need that to confirm me. I don't need that to validate me. I don't need the acceptance of men to do what God created me to do, and, and he has given me the grace to do, you see. So, because I've been so resistant to all of the, the stuff going on with technology, God reminded me that if you have a voice that the world needs to hear, if there's any place that you need to go, 
You see, I don't have to do it myself. Now I have a son who has put me over here and over there and over here and over there, places I have never desired to be, don't want to be, but it is essential when it comes to a word that God wants to speak to his people. What are you saying to us? You don't have to promote yourself. You don't have to try to push yourself. You don't have to try to make yourself a name if there's a voice in you and a word that God put in you. God will fix it so that others will be able to hear that word independent of your involvement. God will do it. And so I still, I seek no occasion to build a name unto myself. You see, because in my heart, in my gut, all I want people to see is Jesus Christ. I have nothing else to offer. Grace. It is undeserved. It is unmerited favor. When God favors us, listen, all this toil and all this grinding, all this pushing, all this shoving, all of this trying to elevate my name. See, you don't have to do that when God has favored you. Everybody say, I want God's favor. It is the undeserved. I didn't deserve it. Didn't merit it. But God bestowed it upon us. And we should be grateful. It's God's omnipotent power. Nobody has this kind of power. I think it was the 60s, all this black power. We got the black power, white power. We got all this Latino power, Asian power. We got all this power. And man actually has no power. My husband and I, we were tickled when uh, we saw some type of... Um, promotion and you know you have your dogs you have your you have your guns and you've got your burglar bars your alarm system you got all this stuff to protect you and this this thief broke into um, the home of these individuals and uh, they thought the dog would bark and the dog started running <laughs> the dog saw what the thief was doing to the owner and it took off so what kind of dog was that right you got the dog for protection. Lighthearted, but you can't even protect yourself. I cannot protect myself. It doesn't matter how we try to do it, you see. This is God's power, his mighty power. Nobody infuses him with power. He has all power. That's why he's called omnipotent. It's an attribute unique to God. And no human being can claim this. He's got this omnipotent power, and this is what he does. He works on the behalf of his children. So who do you want working for you? Who do you want on your side? Who do you want to really be your defense firm and sure? Listen, that's God Almighty. He is all-powerful. All-powerful. He's the God who has withdrawn his wrath. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says, if any man, generically speaking, if any man be in Christ, he is, come on, inclusive of the female man, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. That all sin nature passed away. All things have become new. Now I'm a new creation. What does it mean? It, it means that I am now a habitable place. It means that God has withdrawn his wrath. It means that God has wrapped me with his grace. So I'm a new creation. I'm a new species. God did that. Everybody say it's called grace. It's called grace. God's power extended to us to overcome, please hear, evil tendencies. You see, and all of us, every breathing one of us in here must deal with evil tendencies. Why is that the case? Because we are in a body of sin, a dirt pot. And the body hates, listen, anything that's holy, anything that's righteous, the body hates it. You see, that's why Paul said, I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection. Lest that after having preached the gospel to others, I myself, I'm looked upon as a counterfeit, as a castaway, a dakimas, right? Teaching and preaching things that I don't live, that I'm not committed to, that, that I don't really believe myself. 
I have to keep under my body. Anybody in here, you have to keep under your body. You have to keep your body under control. Let's keep your body under control. And for those of you who didn't raise your hand, understand you still have to keep it under control. We have to keep it under control when we're eating. How many of us really, I'm not asking you to show, listen, don't raise your hand. Listen, you, you know you're full, but you keep on eating. We have to keep the body under and tell it you have eaten enough. <laughs> you have watched enough. All of this Netflix stuff. I've watched enough. I've heard enough. I've shopped enough. God's power extended to us. This divine enablement to help me overcome evil tendencies. Being enraged in Houston's traffic. <laughs> Playing the road rage game. This is God's power that keeps us from cursing people out. Pulling out their weave. You know what I mean. So, that ain't your hair. <laughs> God's power that keeps us humble when arrogance and pride wants to rise. This is God's power that keeps us from digital pornography. Let's wake you up today, right? God's power that keeps us from all of this weed consumption. It's God's power working on the inside of us, causing us to love unlovely people, rude people, cart people, hard-hearted people. It's God's enablement. I'm going to love you anyway. I won't treat you the way you treat me. That's divine assistance, you see. This is God's power enabling his followers to do, listen, with ease. It looks so easy. What we could never do without divine assistance and intervention. It's God's goodness expressed to those who deserve, listen, condemnation, deserve damnation. We deserve hell. But God said no. That's grace. God accepting us based upon what Jesus Christ accomplished at Calvary. You see. So we've learned this, that there are too many who seek to subvert the purity and the truthfulness of the gospel message, these diluted, sugar-coated, feel-good messages. I just want to go to church and feel good. Now, it's okay that I'm sinning against God, but I just want to feel good. God forbid that we preach sermons that undermine the power of the established order of God, the, the standard that God has set before his people. We should get convicted every time we come to church if the Holy Ghost is present. Yes. We ought to experience conviction. Why is that the case? Because we don't have, listen, perfect people. Right. We have flawed people, and the Holy Spirit should convict us when we're not in alignment with God's will. With, with the standard that God has given us, listen, we don't need to add anything to the Bible. We just need to be doers of this. I don't need to add anything to it. I don't need to add a poem to this, right? I don't need to dress it up and make it sound all fancy with cl cliches. I just need to do it, right? I want to teach it, and I want to make sure that I live it. It's the standard he has given us. It is, he has called us to a life of obedience. It is hapakua. Hapa means under, akua means to hear. So I hear, positioned under the authority of God, I hear what he is saying, and listen, my response is just to obey him. It is hapa, akua. How do I hear? I hear under, I must come under the authority of God. God wants us to love him. Lord have mercy. And demonstrate our love for him through our obedience. He just wants us, show me you love me. Uh -huh. Show me you love me. Where do we get this from? John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, all I ask is that you keep my commandments. You see, if you love me, just obey me. That's not deep. If you love me, demonstrate it. Prove it to me. So understand, within the context of marriage, there is one husband and one wife. And this is God's standard. All this other stuff with polygamy and you got more, you got, and it's usually more than one wife. It's not a whole bunch of husbands. What's up with that, right? With God, listen, God said, therefore shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife and the two become one. So every man has to be committed to the one. 
every woman wife committed to the one. All this passing ourselves around and sleeping around, that is not God's order. That's the culture. That comes out of the kingdom of darkness. God said, man, you get one woman. Woman, you get one husband. And your body is for that one. Are you all understanding? And within the context of marriage, we require faithfulness because that's what God requires. So, husband, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Your wife, your one wife. Everybody say one, just because so, some of us really got this mixed up. I mean, just one. In that context, there is the requirement of faithfulness, the demonstration of love sacrificially, unconditionally, right? We give up. We live selfless, not selfish. But the greater, Jesus says, the, the greater mystery is seen within the context of the covenant that God has with his children. We've got one Christ and one bride. Now, with Israel, God would uh, make it clear in scripture, you have gone a whoring after other gods. You see. Because God, listen, he doesn't play that. It's just me. It's just you and me. One bride and we have the Christ. But we don't have idolatry, all these other gods. We don't like to hear the word whore. You need to read the King James Version in the Old Testament. And God called Israel a whore. Because you want more than just me. And I won't have it that way. It's just me. Are you all okay? No, I ain't okay. You don't supposed to use the words like that. Listen, you just go read the book. Re read the book. Within this context, this relationship, Christ, listen, he keeps his word. He keeps his promises according to the covenant. In marriage, we honor our word. We're in this covenant. Listen, and divorce is not considered an option. That's why, listen, I am I'm very guarded before I enter into the institution because I understand divorce is not an option. I'm in it for the long haul. Right? God took us with all of our mess-ups, all of our hang-ups, all this weird, freaky stuff. <laughs> you know, I ain't signed up for all this freaky stuff, you know what I'm saying? That's why you find out as much as you can before you say, I do. Now, because there's bound to be some freaky stuff in there if there's no transformation. Transformation will flush out all of that freaky stuff. What's wrong with y'all? Ain't, ain't, ain't no freaky stuff in me. I beg to differ. <laughs> I beg to differ. We need to go through a metamorphosis. And only the power of God can do that. God keeps his word. It's according to the, the covenant. So he expects that we are equally true to the covenant. Now, everybody in here, you, listen, you say you're in covenant with the creator, just throw up your hand. I'm in covenant, I'm in covenant with the creator. Okay, in other words, I'm married to him. I'm in covenant with him, right? So that means that, and those of you who didn't raise your hands, it's my prayer that you will get saved, you, you, you'll be born again, because the greatest tragedy facing you right now is that you experience physical death without Christ. It's a dangerous position to be in, to not be in a relationship with Christ. Once I am in this covenant relationship, he expects that we are equally true to the covenant. So he has outlined in the book, this is how you live when you're in covenant with the Christ. This is how we live. So pastor's not preaching anything that is foreign. It, 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 it's just sad to say that in many of our churches, we won't tell folk the truth. Because it won't keep the attendance up and it won't keep the money coming. You just tell people the truth and leave everything else up to God, right? As Christians, listen, if we say we're in covenant with him, we're Christians, we are born again, we make it our chief aim to conform to the principles of the scripture. We model Christ's likeness because God has given us in Christ the principle, the standard, and the pattern that's the model that he wants us to imitate. And we have learned this, that our most effective aspect when witnessing is the embodiment of our actions, our associations, our attitude, our conversations. We are challenged to examine how we represent Christ in this world. 
were challenged to mature, to grow up, to stand higher, and to totally surrender, totally, absolutely surrender to Christ so that the culture will see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Understand this, John the Baptist had one message and he kept on preaching it until they chopped his head off. So I need to keep on preaching this until they chop my head off, right? <laughs> I have to keep on preaching it. Right, right. Listen, listen this, this guy, I don't know why he said this. He says, you know, um, heaven is not the, the best experience for you. And the Reverend and I said, oh no, you got it wrong. It doesn't get any better than heaven, right? But while I'm down here, I recognize that I'm simply a sojourner, a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. But heaven is my eternal home. That's my destiny. And, and that transcends all the goodness of what we could taste down here. Amen. We're going to Colossians 1, 9 through 13. I want you to hear it in the message translation. And while we're going there, I want to quote a scripture because we have, um, we have stated that the most dangerous place on the face of the earth is inside the mind of a person. And it's true, you see, because when you go in and, and blow up a school, shoot up a school, see, that was in your mind. I don't know how dangerous you are until you blow up that school, you see. But the most dangerous place on planet Earth is in the mind of a person. Now, so God tells Joshua something. I want to word it a little differently so that we can understand it. God says to Joshua, Joshua 1 and 8, he says, this book of the law shall not depart out of, listen, your mind. You see, now, I know the scripture says this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. He says, meditate in it day and night so that you observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now, then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you'll have good success. The only way this book of the law could remain in my mouth, it has to first be in my mind. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mind. Meditate in it day and night. Observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you'll have good success. If I'm going to speak it out of my mouth, speak it out of my mouth, which is a discipline, it must be in my mind. And it, listen, if it's not in my mind, listen, how else can my behavior follow? So it's, it's like... It's like the scripture that says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. He forgives all of my iniquities. He heals all of my diseases, right? He redeems my life from destruction. He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Pay attention. He satisfies my mouth with good things. So that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, he satisfies my mouth. My innermost being is what the scripture is saying. You and I, we know this. We cannot eat everything that tastes good. I ain't looking at nobody. We're going to get in some serious trouble. He satisfies my mouth with good things. My innermost being with good things. So that my youth is renewed like the eagles. So I don't have to look old Amen. as I'm aging. Because God's doing a work on the inside of us. The Bible says he is all the while at effectually at work within us. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's doing a work in us. Everybody say he's working in me. Come on, he's working in me. Come on, he's working in me. He's working in me. Why? God wants to do something through me. The world needs to see this. But he's doing a work on the inside of me. And I'm glad about it. To live the elevated life, the higher life, we must think higher. This book of the law, listen, it should be all in my soul. So in the face of temptation, I am constantly, listen, I'm constantly reflecting about what did God say? I, I'm facing a temptation, but what did God say? I got it all in my mind so that it dictates my behavior, my choices, my relationships, my conversations. 
As long as the mind remains in the past, we will repeat the behavior of the past. You know it's so. That's why uh, the Apostle Paul says, now forgetting those things which are behind, I have to let that go. I'm not saying that this stuff didn't happen, but I'm saying I cannot afford to be governed by what happened yesterday today. It's going to trip me up. It's going to hold me back. Colossians 1, 9 through 13. Can we see it in the message? Can we see it in the message? Be assured that from the first day we heard of you, we haven't stopped praying for you. Asking God to give you wise minds and spirits attuned to his will, not your will. So again, it bears repeating, God doesn't give you the desires of your heart. You've been praying and wondering, why hasn't he given me the desires of my heart? It's a prayer you're praying that he cannot honor because he never promised you that. That's your interpretation of what you read or somebody else said it to you. But the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God says, I'm the one. And so since I can't trust you, bad boy, I will give you the desires of my heart. You start desiring what I desire, what I want. That's what I will honor. That's what I will bring to pass. Be assured that from the first day that we heard of you, we haven't stopped praying for you, asking God to give you wise minds and spirits attuned to his will and so acquire a thorough understanding of the ways, listen, in which God works. So I want to understand his consistent, unchanging nature. And when I do, there's some things I will never pray. I will never ask God to do some things that I've been asking him to do. Because I have become intimately aware of his consistent, unchanging nature. I found out how he works. We pray that you'll live well for the master. Now, you all need to write this down, please. And, and your challenge this week, I want to live well for the master. I want to live well for the master. I want to live well for the master. So wait a minute. Is this living well for the master? Wait a minute. Is this living well for the master? Wait a minute. Is this living well for the master? Can we see it? Making him proud of you as you work hard in his orchard. Anybody you want to make God proud? God, I, I, want, I want to make you proud. I want to make you look good. I want to please you. It should be our, our, heart, our heart posture. As you learn more and more, listen, how God works. All of us should be on this path. I want to learn more and more. How does God work, you see? If I understand, listen, what he has done, I will understand what he will do. And the Bible is clear. In Corinthians, God says this. Listen, all this stuff that you see happening in the nation of Israel, pay attention because this stuff serves as an example. So we don't repeat the same things that they did. You will learn how to do your work. We pray that you'll have, listen, <laughs> the strength to stick it out over the long haul. In other words, don't quit. We're not weary in well-doing. In due season, we will reap if we faint not. Well, we got a lot of quitters. Come on now. You never win the race if you stop. You got to keep running. Well, you know, it's yours hard. But remember, we have grace. We have grace. Divine assistance, enablement, so that we can run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, when do I get tripped up? When I get my focus off of the author and the finisher of my faith. When do I get tripped up when Jesus is not my focus? All of this other stuff we're focusing on. We pray, we pray that you'll have the strength to stick, stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives it is strength, this is divine enablement, it's grace that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Thanking the Father who, oh, wait a minute, who makes us strong enough. What do we call that? Grace. To take part in everything bright and beautiful that he has for us. God rescued us from dead in alleys. Can you see it? And dark dungeons. 
dark dungeons, right? He set us up in the kingdom of the son he loved so much, the son who got us out of the pit we were in. What was your pit? What was your thing? What were you in that God got you out of? Got rid of the sins we were doomed, listen, doomed to keep on repeating. We were going to keep on doing it. Some of us sitting here today, we're still doing it over and over and over and over and over and over again. The Bible says that he made us fit. He qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He delivered us from the powers of darkness. He translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He has given us divine enablement. Actions and attitudes are always proportional to the condition of the soul. You, you know, listen, when you see my attitude, you just saw my soul. You saw my actions, you just saw my soul. Listen, when you see these deeds done in my body, you're just seeing the condition of my soul. That's why his word, listen, has to wash out my mind, flush out my mind. Yes, sir. Ephesians 4, 31, 32. We talked about the devastation of resentment. It's that backward motion where you just keep on bringing up that stuff that happened in the past. It, it happened in the past. Leave it there. Yeah. What did I learn from it? Let me move on. Yeah. Get rid of all bitterness. This is kind of stuff that holds us back and keeps us down. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger. Well, wait a minute. Good God Almighty. Doesn't the Bible say be angry and sin not? You see, anger has to be managed. Can y'all see it? Otherwise, you just go around shooting up people and blowing up people, right? Cutting up people. Anger must be managed. And grace gives us the ability to manage it. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words. What do you use that tongue to do? Uh-oh, that's a dangerous question. I shouldn't even ask that one. <laughs> harsh words and slander. Listen, cutting up people with your tongue, slandering people with the tongue, assassinating, killing the influence and the character of people with the tongue. You see, murder is not just confined to a weapon. But the tongue is a mighty weapon wherein we tear people down. As well as, listen, God says, okay, just in case we didn't name your thing as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind. Wow. Be kind and do good. Bring happiness to others. Reverend wrote that song. Be kind. You can be kind. You see, grace is divine assistance, enablement to be kind. Kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ. Uh -oh, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So the next time we start popping off about not forgiving folk, uh, just as Christ has forgiven you. Right? How many of you are glad he, he's, for, he's forgiven us? Whoa, and we ain't gonna tell it. We're not gonna, we, we're not gonna tell it. We can't tell y'all all that he has forgiven us of. So let's be careful, right? The church is the light of the world. We understand this, not the darkness of the world. That's why we don't do what the world does. Amen. God Almighty, could God have a church that really depicts the light, the light of the kingdom, the brightness of the kingdom? To live as light, we must think light. Be saturated with light. Listen, we must surround ourselves with light. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Now, if you all don't like this particular rendition that I'm reading from, it, it, it just simplifies what I'm trying to share with you all by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If you need to go back and read it in the King James, the New American Standard, if you want to, right? The English Standard, you go back and do that. I'm reading this today. <laughs> Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? 
you've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. So in other words, what benefit am I to the kingdom if I'm not salty? God called us to be the salt of the earth, right? Now, notice the scripture says further, here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I have put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, what does he tell us to do? Shine. The church should be, we should be blinding folk with our brightness and with our light. Right? Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Remember, we're presenting our lives now to this culture. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So why is it so important that the church shine brightly? People are searching for hope. Hope amid all the confusion and all the hypocrisy and all the chaos in this world. People want hope. Can we be it? Why should we shine so brightly? People are seeking peace in the face of stormy winds and, and the waves of life. Just the stuff that we are dealing with. Understand, people need to see us. Why? People want stability and security amid all the chaos in a world that is unstable and insecure. Why? People need to see in God's people love. Not gossip, not slander, not backbiting and being a busybody. They need to see joy. All Christians can't be depressed. All of us cannot be taking Xanax. Come on, saints. Is there any Christian with any joy, unspeakable and full of glory? Are, are, are there Christians who have peace? Are there Christians who are just down? We're just happy. We're just happy in Jesus. Circumstances can look bad. But we're not poor mouthing it and complaining and whining. I like saying this whiners will never be winners. Because all you do is whine. <laughs> y'all missed that. Now y'all get me. I got I got one more scripture I got to read. So y'all gonna have to stay with me. People need to see God's people in a place of compassion. So can I just tell something personal on myself? So I'm I'm in this, uh, this nail salon, and so I go in there to, and all the ladies, y'all don't get jealous because you should be doing it too, right? I went to get my pedicure, and I went to get my nails done. Now, all the ladies say amen, say amen. Now, I ain't going to tell you to look at your nails now. I'm not going to say nothing. So while I'm in there, this lady comes in. She says, uh, this girl is deaf, and we're trying to you know, take up some money to help her. And, um, you know, they were getting one no after the other. And I was thinking, that's a good idea. You know, if you're in a nail, if you're in a nail salon getting your nails done, you probably got a little money. Y'all didn't even get it. Because, listen, if you ain't got no money, you, you shouldn't be up in there. How you going to pay for the service? Oh, God Almighty. So the, the girl, she, she, she can't talk, so she's mumbling and, they're asking for money, and so I, I go in my purse, and I take out cash to give her. Another lady who was sitting in there, I said, now, if it's a scam, that's between them and God. But for me to give, just in case, this need is authentic, I want to be a part of that. Can you see it? I'm not going to be up in here splurging, getting a pedicure and nails done and not help somebody if there's a need. So she says, and we're giving these cookies. I said, no, ma'am, I don't need your cookies. That's another story. I don't need your cookies. But I do want to support what you're trying to do. Are y'all understanding? So the, the whole idea is that people need to see compassion. Are you kind enough while you're getting your nails done to help somebody else who cannot afford it? Right? 
And then not, listen, I don't want your cookies, not expecting anything in return. And you see it. People need to see stability. They need to see security. They need to see the God in us, folk. Everybody can't be depressed and say we're followers of Christ or angry or going through a divorce. And I close with one final scripture. Romans 12, I want you to hear it in the message. You've already heard it in another translation. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. What is that called? Grace. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it, listen, place your life before God as an offering. Can we lift our lives up as an offering to him? Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted, please pay attention, well-adjusted to your culture, that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be, listen, you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you. And we've told you earlier, what is that word? Hapa'okua, it is called obedience. And quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Now remember, we're called to stand higher. The culture dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-informed maturity in you. So we close with a key statement, the culture will always drag us down. Always. But God's word will always lift us up to reign as kingdom ambassadors. Who you're really representing. So next week, we're going to close out the series. And I want to answer a question our elder asked during marriage enrichment. Why are people poor? I'm going to give you several reasons why we're spiritually poor. Several reasons why we're materially poor. And we'll start up with 2 Corinthians 5, and we're going to talk about what this means to be an ambassador. Amen? Amen. Let's thank God for his word, everybody. <laughs> but Father, we thank you for your word on today. We thank you that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we have heard you say to us that living a life that honors you is not difficult. It's not hard. You have given us grace, divine assistance, divine enablement to do what would otherwise be humanly impossible. We can do it with ease because of divine assistance. Thank you, Father, for the many who raised hands professing to be in covenant with you. We recognize, Father, that being in covenant with you means that we vow to be faithful as we adhere to the terms of the covenant. God, we bless you for those who are already born again in the family of God, those who are already shining brightly, light in the midst of a dark, dark world. And we pray for those, God, who, who didn't raise their hands for whatever reason. Sometimes, Father, it's because of the weight of condemnation. I trust that you'll remind us that in Christ, there is no condemnation. And that if we have sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Our mediator, our great high priest, God, we can confess those sins. You said that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins, God. And you said you'd cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we don't keep on repeating the same offense. I pray for these. And then I pray for those, Father, who they've never entered into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've never been born again. I pray, God, that as only you can do, remove the blindness from their eyes, and the hardness from their hearts, the darkness from their souls. I ask for divine intervention because Jesus said no man can come to him unless the Father draw. And these, Father, many who couldn't raise their hands saying that I'm born again, they, they can't come to the Christ God unless you begin to draw. Oh, God, and I'm believing you even now to draw. Touch their hearts. 
And let them have a real, real encounter with you so they come to know that you're God, that you're sovereign, that you're alive, that you're actively involved in the affairs of men, and you have given us a mediator, a Savior, Jesus the Christ. God, we're impotent in and of ourselves to do anything that means anything without you. I trust you to save the lost, to restore the backslidden, and those who have grown comfortable, just cold, complacent, set us on fire. I believe you to do it. God, as we receive this word on today, stand to your feet. Thank you for these, Father, who are streaming in and these who are Attended, Father, I know, God, that you have spoken a word. You said to him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thank you, God, for those who have ears to hear. As we leave this place on today, God, many staying over for 12 o'clock, we, we recognize that we can never leave your presence. You are Jehovah Shammah. You said you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Lord God, that angels are encamped around about us. Thank you for being that hedge of protection. We realize we cannot protect ourselves. Thank you, Father, that as I entrust these to you, you're well able to keep that which I've committed unto you against that day before this service today and even now. You pulled us by a strong and a mighty arm by the word of your power. Thank you for ministering spirits who hearken unto the voice of your word. And I thank you that there shall no evil befall us, neither shall any plague or calamity come nigh to us. You've given your angels charge over us and every disease, germ, and virus that touches our bodies. We recognize, God, that you are Jehovah Rapha. You're God, our healer. God, you heal. Thank you for doing it. Holy Spirit, we recognize that there's a fall in every one of us. You alone are well able, oh God, to keep us from falling. Present us faultless before the Father's presence with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, honor, dominion, and power now henceforth and forevermore. And the church said, Amen.